Currently, he is a professor of history at Virginia Tech. And without uh, further ado, please join me in welcoming Dr. Lucian Holness. All right, thank you so much, Chris. Thank you, Chris, the HSP for the invitation and the audience for being here and the sponsors for this event. So my project, my presentation for tonight looks at the Underground Railroad in Western and South Central Pennsylvania. So I'll start now. So escaped African-Americans had been, enslaved African-Americans had been escaping from bondage since the 17th century, but it's not until the 1820s and 1830s that active organized efforts to assist fugitive slaves from enslavement actually begins in the North. And you can see from this map here, the very detailed pathways. I mean, they evolve over time. They're not permanent with the Underground Railroad, but the way in which they shift over time, but just how extensive this network runs throughout Pennsylvania, outside of Philadelphia. So the Underground Railroad began with the enslaved individual's determination to escape bondage without the courage, tenacity, and psychological resiliency that these fugitives displayed in breaking away from bondage, the Underground Railroad would have never come into existence. This decision to escape slavery was fraught with risk and sometimes heartbreaking. In most cases, running away from bondage meant leaving behind family, friends, and the only world they knew they had ever known. For many slaves who fled from bondage, Pennsylvania was either a final destination or a way station as they continued their journey northward. Pennsylvania, for many enslaved people, was an attractive destination because the Keystone State had put slavery on the slow path to extinction through its March 1st, 1780 Gradual Abolition Act. The Keystone State also adopted what we call personal liberty laws, laws that afforded alleged fugitive slaves certain legal protections such as jury trials to protect free blacks from being kidnapped and large black communities that assisted in protecting and aiding escaped slaves. The Keystone State was also home to a number of free black communities that play a crucial role in creating and maintaining the Underground Railroad throughout key portions of Pennsylvania. They harbor escaped slaves beyond the detection of their enslavers and kidnappers and transport escaped slaves to places of safety. One of the best known agents of the un Underground Railroad and the head of the Philadelphia Vigilance Committee was William Still. However, however, Philadelphia is just one area where the Underground Railroad operated and flourished. My presentation for tonight focuses on the Underground Railroad in Western and South Central Pennsylvania. By focusing on these two parts of the state, I hope to show the crucial role that African-Americans played in fighting slavery and its encroachment into Pennsylvania as well as focusing on the strategies of these activists and key figures in this movement. And finally, I hope to show that the Underground Railroad in these two regions of Pennsylvania had significant political ramifications locally, which in turn rippled outward into state politics and on many occasions into national and international politics. So if we look at the Underground Railroad in Western Pennsylvania, starting off there, so portions of the Underground Railroad and I'm gonna to focus tonight more so on Pittsburgh, uh, witnessed considerable, considerable traffic. Pittsburgh was a central hub of the Underground Railroad and many of its activists involved, were involved in assisting slaves escaping from bondage. And so here are just some of the prominent figures of the Underground Railroad in Pittsburgh. We have John Bashan, who is a master barber, has his own barber shop, born to a white father and black mother in Norfolk, Virginia, 1792. He's a veteran of the War of 1812, and at one point he leaves Carlisle, Pennsylvania, the east for Pittsburgh. He's a prominent member of Pittsburgh's Black community. He establishes the city's first public baths and promotes a number of reform efforts from anti-slavery, temperance, temperance societies, and schools. John Peck is another prominent figure of the Underground Railroad in Pittsburgh, Pittsburgh being the largest Black community in Western Pennsylvania. That's why that's the central focus. So Peck was born in Hagerstown, Maryland and educated in Northern Virginia. He left Car Car Carlisle, Pennsylvania in 1821 and moved to Pittsburgh approximately in 1837. Again, he's a prominent black businessman like Bashan. He opens a barbershop 
And he held the status of the city's leading wig makers. So these are many members, many of these activists who are part of the Underground Railroad are members of the black elite. He's a minister at the Wiley Street AME Church in Pittsburgh. Lewis Woodson, who is an escaped slave from Virginia in 1806, relocates his family to Ohio in 1820, becomes active in a number of local anti-slavery efforts in Ohio, but that's not just anti-slavery. He's also involved in education and other reform efforts. And in Ohio, he's also working as a conductor on the Underground Railroad. And he, he's involved in uplift efforts, teaching African-American students in numerous towns in Ohio. And he founds a black school and benevolent society. When he arrives in Pittsburgh, he does many of these same activities. In 1828, he became an ordained member in the AME church, he worked as a barber and businessman. And as I said before, he, when he moves to Pittsburgh, which is in 1831, he continues to undertake these efforts, these efforts of institution building. And then we also get Martin Delaney, who was born in 1812 in Charleston, Virginia, now West Virginia, the son of a free seamstress and a plantation slave. The 1820s, he's taken by his mother to Western Pennsylvania after Virginia authorities threatened to imprison her for teaching her children to read. Many African-Americans in Pittsburgh and Western Pennsylvania, uh, many of them trace their uh, lineage to places like Virginia, these slave states, where they leave these slave states for areas where they would have more freedom like Pennsylvania. So again, Martin Delaney is a major prominent figure in the local black community. He moves to Pittsburgh in 1831, where he studied with Lewis Woodson and other black leaders becoming part of the leadership class in Pittsburgh. In the 1840s, he apprentices as a doctor and he edits one of the first African-American newspapers in Western Pennsylvania, The Mystery. But at one point in 1847, he leaves Western Pennsylvania for New York to, to co-edit the North Star with Frederick Douglass. Uh, Martin Delaney and these other individuals are very active in the Underground Railroad. For instance, in an 1848 letter to Frederick Douglass, which was published in the North Star, Martin Delaney observed that the operations of the Underground Railroad in the city of Pittsburgh were doing a fair business. In fact, in the midst of writing to Douglas, Delaney wrote that an escaped slave had just entered his room with another man seeking his assistance and advice. So if you look beyond Pittsburgh and other areas of Western Pennsylvania, the smaller towns, smaller towns, rural communities, it's a slightly different picture. To give you one example, Washington, Pennsylvania, which is a few miles south of Pittsburgh in Washington, Pennsylvania, abolitionists experienced less traffic as they were farther from communities with considerable slave populations, and given that its black community is much more smaller compared to Pittsburgh. But these elite leaders like Delaney, Woodson, uh, Vashon, were not the only ones involved in the Underground Railroad. The Underground Rail Railroad in Pittsburgh was sustained by everyday people, everyday African-Americans. And Pittsburgh hotels were an important site of the Underground Railroad. One of the most famous sites being the Monongahela House, because Pittsburgh hotels were areas where slaveholders who traveled to the north via the Mississippi River, the Ohio River, for business to northern seaports to escape the south, the humidity of the south, would normally stay in Pittsburgh. That would be a way station for people traveling from the south as they made their way to the north. And Pittsburgh would be this prime destination because of the city's location at the end of the Ohio River and ties to the east. It's a major way station for slave or slaveholders traveling northward and westward. So traveling alongside them, enslavers brought their bonds people with them, who they might refer to as servants to escape any legal complications in Pennsylvania. In Pittsburgh, black hotel workers like the ones at the Monongahela House were a small component of a large clandestine network known as the Philanthropic Society. The organization was established in the late 1830s, serving as both a benevolent society and as a secret society dedicated to protecting Blacks from being abducted into slavery by enslavers who walked the city's streets and slave catchers and kidnappers. The Monongahela House was the city's most famous hotel located in the heart of the city. And it's the site of numerous rescues 
of enslaved people who were brought to Pittsburgh by their enslavers as they're journeying either northward, further northward, or eastward on business or vacation. So I just want to give you one example, one story of one of these daring escapes. So on a spring morning in 1847, excitement filled Pittsburgh streets as news spread throughout the city of an attempted rescue of a slave from that hotel. Daniel Lockhart, the bondsman of Lloyd Logan, a planner from Winchester, Virginia, had resided in the city for a number of weeks as a fugitive and had been working as a laborer. When Logan finally uncovered Lock Lockhart's whereabouts, he, along with two constables from Winchester, set out for Pittsburgh, arriving at the Monongahela house that evening. At 11 o'clock the next morning, these three men lured the runaway slave to the hotel and attempted to seize him. When the three men attempted to take him into bondage, Lockhart cried for help. His cries could be heard throughout the hotel, causing much excitement and alarm. All the while, a crowd of Black Pittsburghers, many of them workers at the Monongahela house, gathered outside the hotel in hopes of seizing Lockhart from the grasp of his owner and the two Virginia constables. Just as the three men exited the Monongahela house and attempted to make their way to the city wharf to board a steamer back to the south, a crowd of African-Americans brushed the three men. One of the constables was struck and the other was knocked to the ground and injured. The group that carried Lockhart off to safety and he later fled to Canada beyond the reach of his enslavers. So it's a successful rescue attempt of, of Lockhart. Pittsburgh's location as a railroad hub between the east and the west and at the head of the Ohio River provided an efficient route where they could, where enslavers could quickly reach the slave markets of the south and make a substantial profit. On May 28, 1853, Pittsburgh officials received a telegraphic dispatch from a member of the Pennsylvania Abolition Society based in Philadelphia that a mixed race youth named Alexander Hen Hendricker from Jamaica was on board a train with a man by the name of Thomas J. Adams. Adams is a Tennessee farmer and slave trader who along with a the boy, they're making the, their, their in route to the city. Adams had persuaded Hendricker to travel with him to California enticing the young man with the prospect of achieving great wealth in the West. When the train entered the depot in Pittsburgh that Saturday, a hastily assembled vigilance committee identified Hendricker because of the telegraphic dispatch from the Pennsylvania Abolition Society in Philadelphia and attempted to take him to safety. But Adams cried out, that boy belongs to me. Ignoring Adams' claim, the vigilantes delivered Hendricker into the custody of John Fox, a local police officer. So Fox took Hendricker to the St. Clair Hotel, where the, which is another Pittsburgh hotel, where the Vigilance Committee made up of, of course, many of them, many of its members made up of black hotel workers at the St. Clair Hotel, filed a writ of habeas corpus, habeas, a writ of habeas corpus. And they passed the writ to a man by the name of Robert Haig, Pittsburgh's high constable. The following Monday, the case came before Judge Thomas Williams. Adams failed to appear in court, having fled the city the previous evening. So Hendricker was freed and sent to live with Black, with Black Pittsburgh abolitionist John Peck and his family until the British consul at Philadelphia could help arrange safe passage for his return back to Jamaica. After the incident, the city's Black leaders, Martin Delaney, John Peck, William Webb, Thomas Burrow, and there are a number of black leaders, so many of them in, in Pittsburgh. These black leaders sent a letter to the editor of the Kingston Morning Journal, a Jamaican newspaper, warning black men and mixed race Jamaicans of the perils of traveling to the United States, declaring no person of color in the United States is really free. All are virtually and legally, if not objectively slaves. So the Underground Railroad in Pittsburgh played an important role as this as the head because of its central location, at the end of the Ohio River as a rail depot. And it's why these attempted escapes, many of them successful, are widely reported in the press. So it's not a secret thing. Uh, one of these, this is one example of a news headline from the Pittsburgh Gazette recounting a rescue at the Monongahela House, 
where a man by the name of John Drennan, a prominent white Southerner, brings one of his bonds people to Pennsylvania, to Pennsylvania, to Pittsburgh, where the local, uh, the local black population and hotel workers successfully help that his bondswoman escape. So it, enslavers know a great deal that there's a huge risk of coming into Pittsburgh. And one of the reasons why they come is they believe that Pittsburghers have a responsibility, not just Pittsburghers, but Pennsylvanians, all Pennsylvanians have a right to have a duty and obligation to respect the property rights of slaveholders. And that includes assisting in the rendition of slaves who might escape. And many African-Americans disagree with that. And so they work, especially these black workers in these hotels, work to ensure that Pennsylvania, Pittsburgh especially, remains a free soil space, a space without slavery. This idea that people who arrive, a slave who arrives in Pittsburgh is automatically free. And we also have the stories of many workers. Hallie Quinn Brown, her father, who worked at the Monongahela House, his story was recorded by his daughter, Hallie Quinn Brown, Holly Q. Brown, about his story and the role that black workers served in these attempted rescues of enslaved people who were brought to Pittsburgh. So the Underground Railroad in South Central Pennsylvania also witnessed considerable activity. The attempted rescue and protection of escaped slaves in this part of the state also had far reaching consequences that stretch across the Keystone State. In 1832, one example, in 1832, Margaret Morgan, an enslaved woman, left Maryland to join her freeborn husband in Pennsylvania, where she had given birth to several children. John Ashmore, who, her owner, never formally emancipated Margaret's enslaved parents, instead allowing them to live virtually free. When Ashmore died in 1824, his widow, Margaret, coincidentally named after the black woman in this case, Margaret, claimed Margaret and her children as her property. So the enslaver, the enslaver Margaret, sent Edward, Edward Prigg, a slave catcher, to York, Pennsylvania with a warrant for the seizure and arrest of Morgan and her children. Prigg found and took the alleged bondswoman and her children back to, Pen, back to Maryland. He did so in violation of Pennsylvania law failed to secure, so under Pennsylvania law, he was required to secure a certificate of removal, which was needed for the rendition of an alleged fugitive slave to another state. Prigg was charged with kidnapping under Pennsylvania's 1826 personal liberty law and convicted. Marylanders were outraged at the actions taken by Pennsylvania, believing that Prigg was well within his right to recapture an escaped slave guaranteed under the Constitution's 1793 Fugitive Slave Clause. And they argue that Pennsylvania courts did not have the jurisdiction in these cases. So to ease tensions and resolve the legal impasse between these two states, Pennsylvania agreed to Maryland's request to allow the Supreme Court to settle this dispute. So in 1842, the Supreme Court hands down the decision, the famous court case, Prigg v. Pennsylvania. The Supreme Court upheld the Fugitive Slave Law of 1793 and declared that the, the national government had an obligation to help return fugitive slaves. But it also ruled that local officials were not required to assist in the return of escaped slaves. That's, a, that's the responsibility of the federal government. This decision led many Northern judges and other state officials to refuse to participate in the return of fugitive slaves. So another far reaching consequence. But another far reaching, another case with far reaching consequences is the Christiana rescue. On September 11th, 1851, Marylander Edward Gorsuch and his party of slave catchers rode into Christiana in Lancaster, armed with a warrant issued by a Philadelphia judge to locate and claim four fugitives. Gorsuch's group included his son, four other relatives, Deputy U.S. Marshals, Henry Klein, and two assistant deputies, a lot of manpower in the attempt to capture these runaway slaves. They were headed for the home of a man by the name of William Parker, a prominent black leader in this community, a black operative who ran a secret militia of underground Minutemen and women. 
Philadelphia's William Still sent word ahead of Gorsuch, so Parker's militia was armed and ready. Uh, the connections between Western Pennsylvania and South Central Pennsylvania were strong to Philadelphia. A lot of communication back and forth, as I mentioned previously, with Western Pennsylvania. Same thing with this case as well. Uh, this community, this Black community's sophisticated in South Central Pennsylvania, this Black community's sophisticated underground network was made up of Black and white farmers and was sustained by supportive political figures, such as abolitionist congressman and Lancaster resident Thaddeus Stevens. Gorsuch and his party were riding into the center of Black resistance in this part of South Central Pennsylvania. When Edward Gorsuch and one of his deputies entered William Parker's home, women and men inside attacked them and a crowd of armed Black men accompanied by a group of white men, of whites, surrounded the house. Gorsuch, in the end, was shot dead with, within minutes. His son and two other relatives were shot and several Black men suffered injuries in the fighting. Parker, two other men from his house, and two of Gorsuch's fug fugitives headed for Canada, leaving town just ahead of a federal force riding into Philadelphia, in from Philadelphia. The federal authorities rounded up rather indiscriminately and arrested a number of suspects, both black and white, and men and women, with an eye toward appeasing slaveholders in Maryland and Virginia. A grand jury, in, so the federal government seeking a grand jury indictment for treason of 45 men linked to uh, this network of the Underground Railroad for having incited war against the United States. However, none of the suspects of the Christiana rescue were ever convicted. So reactions to the Christiana violence and the trials showed how the skirmishes waged between underground operatives and their sympathetic neighbors and slave owners and slave catchers in Pennsylvania's southernmost counties had high intentions along the border. Black and white communities in Pennsylvania's southernmost counties were at the center of this resistance in this part of Pennsylvania. So if we scope out, what was the success and significance of the Underground Railroad? If we look at it beyond Pennsylvania and give it a national view, looking at it in a larger national context. Well, the Underground Railroad and the flight of fugitive slaves to the North actually posed no serious demographic threat to the Southern slave system. As the historian David Brian Davis notes, he notes, he gives the estimate, these are his numbers, between 1830 and 1860, no more than 1,000 or 2,000 fugitive slaves annually made their way to the North and achieved freedom. On average of 1,500, only 0 0.0375, so the number is very minuscule here, of the 1860 slave population totaling 45,000 um, over a roughly 30 year period. The numbers are that small. Um, it's only a trickle of fugitives who are successful. So this represents, to give, to give some context, this represents far fewer than the number of slaves who escaped behind British lines during the American Revolutionary War. So if the Underground Railroad and the flight of fugitive slaves to the North pose no serious demographic threat to the South, why were Southern slaveholders so adamant about stopping the flight of fugitive slaves to the North from stopping enslaved people from taking their destiny in their own, own hands by fleeing and, and engaged in the act of self-emancipation. Well, for slaveholders, the escape of their bonds people represented an economic threat and an ideological threat, an economic threat in terms of when one or more slaves fled, there was an immediate loss of labor that could be difficult or impossible to replace. Slaves who sought and achieved full freedom threatened a major loss of capital which increased in the 1840s and 1850s as the price of slaves rose. When a recaptured runaway was sold, there could be a considerable loss in value if it became clear to buyers that the slave had left repeatedly or headed north. On the other hand, the cost of retrieval amounted to a small percentage of the slave's value. And there's also the ideological threat. Slaveholders were convinced that their system was morally legitimate and superior. Most slaveholders sincerely believed that their own best interests were identical with their slaves. Even though most enslaved admitted that the 
Plus, even though most enslaved, enslavers admitted that the institution, like many others, were capable of abuse, Southern planners expected gratitude for their acts of kindness and indulgence and generosity, and even for their restraint and in inflicting physical punishment. By running away and making their way successfully to the North, enslaved people exposed the facade of slaveholder benevolence and the argument that slaveholders made that slavery was somehow a paternalistic institution or that it was superior to the act of free labor, the idea of working for wages and ownership of oneself. And finally, the underground world would pose a threat not only to the property interests and ideo ideology of slaveholders and pro-slavery propaganda that depicted black bondage in a positive light, but the arrival of runaway slaves into Northern states also put the issue of slavery and black freedom and rights at the center of state and national politics, forcing politicians to address the question of black freedom and slavery, many of whom were reluctant to do so. So the act of the Underground Railroad and the actions of these enslaved people freeing from bondage in Western Pennsylvania and in South, South Central Pennsylvania had important local political ramifications that rippled outward beyond the region, state, and that could have, have national and did have, I should add, national and international implications. So that's it for me. So I'll turn it back over to Chris. Great. Thank you, Lucian. Thank you. Um, so I now uh, would like to introduce our next um, uh, presenter. Um, Dr. Beverly uh, Tomic is the author of Slavery and Abolition in Pennsylvania, um, and she tells me the book is just hitting stores now, so um, shelves now, so you can go to Amazon and, and, uh, and check that out. Um, she's also the author of Pennsylvania Hall, A Legal Lynching in the Shadow of, Li of the Liberty Bell, and Colonization Colonization and its discontents, emancipation, emigration, and anti-slavery in Antebellum, Pennsylvania. Uh, she's also written about anti-slavery, uh, African recolonization, and women's history in articles that have appeared in the American 19th Century History, Pennsylvania History, a Journal of Mid-Atlantic Studies, and HSP's Pennsylvania Magazine of History and Biography, as well as the Canadian Review of American Studies. She has conducted research at the Historical Society of Pennsylvania, as well as the Library Company of Philadelphia as an Andrew Mellon Dissertation Fellow and as an Albert M. Greenfield Foundation Fellow. I'd like to now introduce Dr. Beverly Tomic. Hi, um, I'm very honored to be here today in celebration of the birthday of the great William Still, known historically as the father of the Underground Railroad. By the time Still became a clerk for the Pennsylvania Anti-Slavery Society in 1847, his adopted city of Philadelphia had seen many decades of turmoil as its citizens came to terms with the meaning of emancipation in their own state, much less their position relative to the slave states along their southern border. This evening, I would like to share some background information about the anti-slavery movement and race relations up to Still's arrival in 1844. After that, I will share some of the highlights of Still's work and discuss his importance as both a liberator and as a historian. So I wanna share my screen. Um, It's doing as Chris warned me and not advancing. So let me see how I can fix that. Dug on it and it was working fine earlier. Um, it's always the way. <laughs> right? <laughs> uh, let me see. Maybe if I go to the smaller image. All right, sorry if we have to show them all. <laughs> That is the great William Still right there. Oh, we're, and, um, um, now we're not seeing your screen yet. Oh, wonderful. Now watch it not let me share. Now? Yes. Awesome. So that is the great William Still. 
And um, basically, by the time he arrived in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania reformers had succeeded in ending slavery in the Commonwealth. And then by that point, they were beginning to participate in a larger effort to end slavery throughout the nation. So Pennsylvania has a very honored place in that it was the first state in the US to end slavery by legislative act. It passed a gradual emancipation law in 1780. Now this victory came after years of struggle on the part of black Pennsylvanians and their white allies. Now, of course, black Americans performed the most basic and the most essential anti-slavery acts through daily resistance to their own bondage, which did include running away every chance they could. Now, of course, slaveholders and others who profited directly or indirectly from forced labor worked hard to keep control over the people they claimed to own, and they expected society at large to aid them in recapturing those who managed to escape. The direct resistance of enslaved people led increasing numbers of white Americans to take note of the horrors of enslavement, and their awareness began to compel some to speak up. So the first to do so were German Quakers who issued the first formal written protest against slavery in 1688. And here's a picture of it. It's called the Germantown protest. Now, after that Germantown protest, anti-slavery agitation continued within Quaker ranks and the society managed to end the slave trade among its members in 1740 and then forbade members from owning fellow humans in 1758. Pennsylvania followed by ending the slave trade in 1775 and adopting gradual emancipation in 1780. The road to this victory was a long one and it involved creating alliances and forming groups and the first of those was the Pennsylvania Abolition Society, which many of us call the PAS. Now, I don't wanna bog us down in the finer details of this movement, but I do wanna share two points that I think are very important and quite germane to our discussion here. So first, the early phase of the movement and the groups associated with it, ideally the uh, PAS, have sometimes been described as milder or less radical than later groups that emerged. Now, recent historical analysis, however, has shown that that's actually not the case. They, there were radical and mild elements of the anti-slavery movement throughout its existence, and that's important for us to keep in mind. Secondly, the entire anti-slavery movement was a very complex one. And what's very important here is that it grew out of black resistance and it involved both black and white abolitionists working together in a number of ways. And I wanna show you just a few of these early abolitionists before we move on. So one of the, I guess, most famous is Benjamin Lay. It's an interesting picture of him. It's obviously a painting, you know, that someone used what we know about him to kind of depict what he would have looked like. We know that he was a dwarf. He lived in a cave outside of Philadelphia. He did that by choice. He was making a statement. He was a vegetarian before that was something that was widely seen as a good thing. He was absolutely opposed to the enslavement of human beings. And to get his point across, he did a couple of what we might call dramatic and what a lot of Quakers called inappropriate things. One of those things was he hollowed out a Bible and he took a, a, a I think it was a bladder of some sort, filled it with pokeberry juice, goes into Quaker meeting, which if you know much about Quakers, it's a very quiet, solemn thing. And you probably know that Quakers are pacifists. Well, he goes to meeting with a sword, carrying a Bible, stands up, makes an impassioned statement, stabs the Bible with the sword, and what looks like blood spurts all over the people who are sitting near him. So that got people's attention. What got perhaps even more attention was the time that he kidnapped a slaveholder's child to illustrate his point that there was a trauma involved with having one's children taken away. Of course, he was making the statement that the worst part of slavery in many ways was having your children taken away and sold. Now, um, another abolitionist who would take a quite different stance just in the sense of maybe he wasn't as dramatic per se, but that was Anthony Benize. He was a teacher and he was a writer. What he did is through his written work and that's something we'll see in a minute he has in common with Still. And so through his written work, he argued for the humanity of Africans and African-Americans, and he was instrumental 
and taking the anti-slavery cause beyond the Society of Friends and into society in general. Now, one of my favorite, one of my heroes one of, from the early movement is James Fortin. James Fortin Sr. He, he does end up with a son also named James Fortin. This James Fortin fought in the Revolutionary War. He's captured at one point. He's offered a chance to switch sides and be very well taken care of by the British, and he doesn't. He fights for this country, and in return, obviously, he's going to expect to be treated well. He comes back. He operates a sales shop, and he becomes one of the wealthiest men in the United States. Another early leader and hero is Richard Allen. He's one of the state's most influential Black founding fathers. He's the founder of Mother Bethel Church, so you may have seen it. It's still there. He also worked in cooperation with white and Black abolitionists, bringing people together to fight against slavery and, importantly, to offer services to people after they are freed, be it in education or training for jobs, trying to help people find a place in the new society. But that's the next point I want to tell you a little bit about, and that is that the movement to help people gain and protect their freedom led to a growing free Black population in Philadelphia. And that in turn filled a backlash that hampered efforts to reconstruct the state. And I call this the early reconstruction, and it's a failed reconstruction. They do not find a way early on, some may argue ever, to make room for Black citizens to live in a state of equality. So most white Pennsylvanians, we like to think of this notion that, you know, people start waking up and they realize slavery is awful and bad and they start trying to do the right thing. That was not the case. I tell my students in class, if population is this big, the number of abolitionists would have felt that much. So a tiny percent. And so most white Pennsylvanians had reservations about abolition in their own state. But then when people talk, start talking about spreading abolition and then black refugees begin arriving from other states into Philadelphia and Pennsylvania, many whites are very unhappy. And there's, there's irritation over this idea of job competition. So working class whites resent that former slaves are there now looking for a job and they're competing for the same jobs, but upper and working class whites also resent successful blacks. So men like James Fortin, uh, whites get jealous, the, the lower or working class whites are jealous that, you know, this guy can have a carriage and he can have multiple properties. And so there's that aspect. And then there's the aspect of this idea of racial mixing. And that's another thing that makes many white Pennsylvanians very uncomfortable and unhappy. So what ends up resulting is an atmosphere of racial terror in which the majority of whites are ready and willing to attack black Philadelphians and they do it on a multiple occasions. Now, as that atmosphere is getting worse, there's still the growth of abolition as an undercurrent, a counterculture, if you will. And more groups start to form to join the PAS in the 1830s. In fact, the nation's most famous anti-slavery society, the American Anti-Slavery Society, is actually founded in Philadelphia in 1833. Now, what changes there or what's different is that the newer groups are very vocal about the principle of what they call immediate emancipation. And what they're saying is this whole gradual law that Pennsylvania passed it wasn't good enough. It, it did not free a single person right away. It freed some people's future children. And so this new generation is saying, no, no, not good enough. And they argue that slavery should be brought to an immediate end and that there should be no compensation to slaveholders. That upset some whites, a lot of whites, even those who didn't own enslaved, didn't claim to own other people. And so that heightens the tension I was describing. Now, within Philadelphia abolition, some members of the PAS join in with these newer groups and others stay just in the PAS. So you end up with people fighting through the courts, through every legal case they can bring about to defend individual Black Americans, whether they're enslaved or whether they're already free but facing kidnapping. 
that's one tactic, but then you get more hands-on active tactics. And we're gonna get to that a little more with the Underground Railroad being the most radical of all. Now, um, the violence that, that erupts is there's anti-black violence and there's anti-abolition violence. And the bottom line is people are attacking both black Philadelphians and abolitionists, whether they're white or black. And the most famous incident of that occurs in 1838. So what happens is you get the PAS and the PASS, Pennsylvania Anti-Slavery Society, that's one of the new groups that emerges, and the Philadelphia Female Anti-Slavery Society. They all are trying to spread their word for their cause. And more and more churches are not letting them and, and more and more venues throughout Philadelphia are saying, no, you cannot speak in our place, you know, A, you're too radical, and B, you may get someone mad enough to harm our building. So those groups come together and they build their own building and they come up with $40,000, which to us today may not sound like all that much. This was 1838. So they get the money together, they build this hall, and it survives four days. It, during the fourth day, it is burned to the ground. Now, this first slide I have here you can see the scene there was, as it emerged, this is how it, multiple people reported that it looked. Notice it's not really chaos, right? The building's ablaze. Most reports say that after they got in, broke in and got the fire started, people just stood back and watched. Note that the firemen are putting water on the nearby buildings. They're not trying to put out the fire that's destroying that brand new hall. They're just trying to protect the homes of nearby people. Um, that's sort of the official version of, of how it looks. Here's a, a cartoon I found while doing research on Pennsylvania Hall. And this really kind of draws home what I was saying a while ago about people being paranoid of the idea of black people and white people mixing. Because look at these couples. Look at how many of the couples in this cartoon have a black man and a white woman. Even the little kids, there's a black man and a white woman. And the person that whoever drew the cartoon is focused on is David Paul Brown. Now, David Paul Brown was a member of the PAS. So he's someone that some historians have kind of dismissed as being a milder abolitionist, but he sure wasn't mild to the people at the time because they're very unhappy with him. And, um, so what, I'm, what I want you to take away from this is to know that by the time Steele comes into town, he's coming into a place that, yes, it has a reputation as being the place that first ended slavery in, in, in their own commonwealth. But it also has a reputation as being a dangerous place because it has not rebuilt itself. It has not made room for free black Americans. So someone like Still is coming into a dangerous place. Now, um, as jealousy, resistance and hostility grew, so too did the most radical side of the anti-slavery movement. And that's the movement to aid and abet fugitives. So the issue of slave catching and kidnapping had long provided a source of tension between Pennsylvania and its slaveholding neighbors, particularly Maryland. In 1820, Pennsylvania passed one of those personal liberty laws that Lucian was telling you about earlier. Um, so basically, when a northern state would pass a personal liberty law, they're trying to protect people within their borders. And they make, it's a state's rights argument made in the north that they have the right to protect people from A, um, slave catchers, but B, kidnappers. Because one thing I can't really stress enough is how easy it would be to present yourself as a slave catcher when really you're kidnapping people. Think about this. Martin Delaney, um, one of the people you saw in the previous presentation, he once made a point that was, I was born free. I don't have freedom papers. So if someone went to someone like Delaney and said, hey, you're so-and-so slave, I'm gonna take you back to Mississippi. Well, what is he gonna do? He does not have a freedom paper. So that's part of what they were trying to fight with personal liberty laws. Now that's not popular with Maryland and other states because they expect people in the free states to help reclaim people who have escaped from slavery. 
So what happens is Pennsylvania ends up adopting a little bit milder law in 1826, makes it a little bit easier for an accuser to obtain a warrant against an alleged fugitive. But that still doesn't appease the Southern states. They're still very unhappy. So in 1842, the fugitive issue goes all the way to the Supreme Court in the case of Prigg versus Pennsylvania. Now, um, basically, I, it's complicated and long, but all I would really take away from it is the Supreme Court, through that ruling, declares federal laws supersede state laws. As a result, the personal liberty laws are nullified and so much for states' rights, which if you studied the Civil War, that seems kind of interesting in this context. Now, um, basically, the legislator in Pennsylvania, like any state that tried to have personal liberty laws, isn't real thrilled with this, but they do what they can. And so they also pass a law at this time that before this moment, if you were in the South and you owned people, you could bring them into Pennsylvania with, with you and they could stay there six months and you could continue to claim on this property. Well, during the whole situation with Prigg, the state legislature says no more, you can't even do that. Well, once the state legislature looks kind of supportive by passing that, it's kind of fertile ground then for freedom suits. So more and more PAS abolitionists can initiate freedom suits for individual people. It also encourages the extra legal work of vigilante committees like the one William Still will become involved with. So um, before I talk about William Still and the Underground Railroad, I, I do wanna make a point that Pennsylvania abolitionists had long been involved in helping people escape bondage, whether they were with the PAS or the PASS, no matter what group they were part of, there were people in the group that helped people. And one example is Isaac Hopper. Isaac Hopper was a Hicksite Quaker and a member of the PAS, the group that's seen sometimes as more conservative. And while the PAS as a body operated within the law, it did what it could to ensure freedom through the courts, but individual members like Hopper took matters into their own hands from an early point. Hopper gained a reputation in, in the late 1700s, so that's quite a ways back, in the early 1800s for bending the law by helping captives escape. PAA, PASS members also assisted enslaved people in gaining their freedom through extra legal means. And they began to do this in a more organized manner in the late 1830s by creating special groups called vigilant associations or vigilant committees. Now, Robert Purvis was one of the first to be really central to this effort. And he um, played a great role in creating Philadelphia's Vigilant Committee. He joined efforts with James Fortin, the one I showed you earlier, that was his father-in-law. And they convened a group of men. And in 1837, they formed the Vigilant Association of Philadelphia. So that group, and then another group that would come along pretty quickly, the Female Vigilant Association, worked together to help fugitives and and free people who had been kidnapped. So similar groups would, be, would pop up throughout the state and the region. And basically abolitionists in both the PAS and the PASS assisted the Vigilant Committee. And William Still would end up serving as chairman of that committee in later years. And in fact, there was no one more dedicated to helping refugees and to pres preserving their stories than William Still. So I want to tell you now about William Still's liberation work. William Still was um, not born in Philadelphia, but he moved there in 1844 at the age of 22. Three years after coming to Philadelphia, he married Letitia George. She was a local dressmaker who would work with him, and together they would turn their home into a station on the Underground Railroad. This slide I find interesting. This, this picture was taken just uh, probably two, maybe three years ago. And the house in the box within the box, that's the William Still house. So that's where they lived. Now this big building behind them is the Institute for Colored Youth. And um, the home they created would become a major, major source of activity for the Underground Railroad. Now, 
During that time, his earlier years, he also applied, or earlier years in Philadelphia, sorry, applied for and received the position of clerk in the office of the Pennsylvania Anti-Slavery Society, the PASS. And then from that point forward, he would work closely with both black and white Philadelphians to assist refugees. Now, um, vigilance committee and underground railroad efforts expanded after the 1850 fugitive slave law passed throughout the nation. But by that point, by 1850, William Still and P, uh, an associate of his, the PASS corresponding secretary, James Miller McKim, he went by Miller McKim, they had been working together to funnel people through their office and on to safety. The Philadelphia office of the Pennsylvania Anti-Slavery Society saw a great deal of activity as a major point along the Eastern line of the Underground Railroad. Now you probably remember from a few minutes ago from Lucian that there were, there's a lot of activity and you can see it on this slide as well, but there's basically three major lines and the Eastern, this one over here, is the one that still worked with. So um, this line is the oldest route. It had activity going back as far as the 1780s. And through this work, still helped over a thousand people, including a number of refugees who would go on to become celebrities within the anti-slavery lecture circuit. Two of those are William and Ellen Craft. William and Ellen are a married couple. As you can see on the slide, Ellen was very light complected. And so they came up with this idea that she would pose as a slaveholder. She had the reason for her arm being in the sling is she couldn't write. And if she'd been a slaveholder, she could have written. So they used the idea that her arm was broken so she couldn't sign stuff to get by with why she couldn't write. Uh, it's not evident in this picture, but. She also claimed that she was headed up to Philadelphia because she had a tooth, toothache, she needed some help. So they had a, a gauze around her face too to kind of help even further the disguise. And William portrayed himself, you know, he was her enslaved person, her valet helping her along the way. And they made it, they left from Georgia and made it to Philadelphia in 1848. And I've always found their story fascinating, but theirs probably isn't even the most famous. I would say that probably the most famous case that William still helped with involves a guy named Henry Brown, who to his history has gone down as Henry Box Brown. Now, Henry Brown came up with an idea to mail himself to Philadelphia, to that anti-slavery office I mentioned a while ago. And so the picture has, uh, that's Box Brown and Henry Box Brown coming out of the box. That's William still there opening, helping to take the lid off. Miller McKim is by William still. I'm not sure who the other, uh, I believe it's Patchmore Williamson who's directly behind the box. And I, I don't know the other figure off the top of my head at the moment, but um, there was quite a bit of excitement when that box showed up because they knew they were waiting on it and they knew a box would come. And the question was, is there gonna be a live person in there? And sure enough, when they did their special knock, he answered, and it was a moment that was, I'm sure, very exciting for everyone in the room. Now, Still also worked on another case involving a lady named Jane Johnson. He worked with an associate of his from the PAS named Passmore Williamson. And what happened is Jane Johnson was claimed as a slave by John H. Wheeler, who was the U.S. ambassador to Nicaragua. And they came through Philly and they were going to stay there a few days and then get on a ship. And Jane knew about the activity in Philadelphia. So she managed to get word to William Still and Passmore Williamson, hey, we need help. And they responded. And it's a very long story. It's very fascinating, very much worth reading, but I won't go into the finer details tonight, just know that long story is the police got involved and Passmore Williamson ends up in jail and some others end up in jail. But the reason I'm focused on Passmore Williamson being in jail is he brilliantly played it off. You see the picture on this slide, that's in his jail cell. Well, the abolitionists, they use this as a publicity moment, took pictures, they made little um, cards that they gave out at different anti-slavery fairs or sold of this picture, and that's one of the ways they raise money. He also kept a log or a journal, whatever you want to call it, where anytime someone came to visit him, he had them sign in. 
And there are some pretty impressive names on there, including Harriet Tubman. And if any of you are ever in the Chester County area, that journal is at the Chester County Historical Society now. And so Passmore Williamson basically spends over three months in jail when he is finally exonerated, still is also accused. He's finally, he's exonerated as well. Neither one of them is convicted. And then um, the last sort of example I wanna share with you of Still's work in the Underground Railroad is one that I, I find particularly moving. So William Still, what would happen is a fugitive would come to the office, find Still, and Still would take out his notebook and he would say, okay, where are you from? You know, give me some details and he'd record it. You know, this is the person who professes to be my owner. This is my name. These are my family members. And so in 1850, a gentleman walks into the anti-slavery office and he says, hi there, I'm Peter Friedman. And actually I'm already free, I'm up here, I escaped, but I need help. I was separated from my mother and I would really like to find her. So he starts giving William Still details about his family and his mom and how they were separated. And to make what's maybe already a long story for you short, turns out that's William Still's brother. So Peter Friedman is actually Peter Still. And there's a picture I found of Peter Still. So um, this work that William Still was doing in Philadelphia, abolitionists of different persuasions and both black and white are also doing similar work outside of Philadelphia. There's underground activity, as you saw in the previous presentation. Also, there's quite a bit in Chester, Columbia, York, Gettysburg, Chambersburg. They all became important centers of activity because they're all fairly close to the Mason-Dixon line. Now, regardless of which group they affiliated with, these activists with the vigilance committees and the Underground Railroad are the most radical of the nation's anti-slavery leaders. And after the Civil War ends slavery throughout the U.S., many of these activists continue their efforts by pressing onward for civil rights for Black Americans. Still, for example, does work and um, focuses much of his energy after the war on fighting for the rights of black Philadelphians to ride inside the city's streetcars. So he continues throughout his life to fight for black rights. Now, his activism spans through pre and post Civil War years, but I would argue that his greatest activism of all was the work he did as a historian. Now, William Still, if, if, you know, if we could talk to him right now, he would, probably wouldn't, I don't think he would necessarily tell you, hi, I'm William Still, historian, but, the work he did in taking down the information of every person who came into his office, to me, that makes him very much one of our earliest, most important historians. He helped fugitives, but he also carefully recorded their stories. And then after the Civil War, he will have all that published in a book and very widely circulated. And that book is important as the only comprehensive primary source on the Underground Railroad, and it shares the stories of 995 people who would otherwise have been lost to history. Now, the journal he kept, here's a picture of it, that's what will be on display at the HSP, I believe, uh, Chris said on Thursday. That is absolutely worth going to see if you have any way to do so. It's, it's very moving. Uh, you can see in here, He's got the date, you know, March 31st arrived, and then he puts the name, and then he puts where they're from, he puts who has claimed ownership over them, where he can, he puts family members, just seeing all that is very powerful. And um, if you want to see that and more, some of the collections that are very important at the HSP, in fact, I would have, they've been my most important and favorite are right here, the Pennsylvania Abolition Society Papers. So William Still's Journal C is in there, and so are those letters that we talked about earlier. Any kind of source you need about any abolitionist in Philadelphia and Pennsylvania, you can probably find in that collection. So why does all this matter, right? It's just history. Well, because what happens particularly, and the reason I would call Still's final act of activism, his history, 
is because this particular source really drives home the role of Black Americans in fighting for their own freedom and pushing the abolition movement and making others listen and making people wake up. So basically through Still's journal and the book he published, we see that enslaved people took the lead in their own liberation. And that yes, they're assisted by brave abolitionists, white and black. And so that kind of network is something we need to remind ourselves of, especially in a day and age when there's so much left to do. So thank you, I appreciate you joining us tonight. Great. Thank you, Beverly. And thank you, uh, Dr. Holness, both for, for wonderful presentations. Um, so I will uh, invite both of you to come back on. And um, we do have some questions. Um, so and let's see here. And oh, I think you may have to stop your